OK, all right. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure this morning to um, introduce uh, our speakers this morning. Uh, Doctor, uh, this is a joint effort between uh, uh, intensive uh, care uh, from cardiac anesthesia uh, and also with cardiology. So um, uh, Dr. Uh, Pietro De Santo, who doesn't need any introduction to cardiology, is cardiology training here, currently an interventional fellow, uh, well published, um, uh, including uh, sub studies of the Dore Me trials lead author, um, and has a definite interest in uh, intensive care. Um, and uh, um, uh, uh, JP Larkin, who is a um, cardiac uh, anesthesiology fellow, um, who uh, did his uh, training in Western. Uh, we uh, very much look forward to your presentation on the box trial. I'll hand it over to you guys to take it away. And, uh, th thank you, Dr. Meelans, for that nice introduction there. So uh, as mentioned, the purpose of today's rounds is going to be to discuss uh, the box trial and the two arms of that, in which they were investigating MAP and oxygenation targets in the survivor of, uh, for survivors of cardiac arrest. Um, we left uh, a decent amount of time for discussion either at the end or throughout the presentation. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat box and uh, Dr. Dickey, Dr. Venus will be able to see those uh, and manage to, to facilitate some discussion ideally. So in terms of uh, the objectives for today's presentation, um, we're going to go over the evidence behind MAP and oxygenation targets after cardiac arrest, discuss the methodology in both of the arms of the box trial, discuss some of the strengths and limitations of the study um, and discuss how this trial will ultimately impact our critical care practice. Um, just uh, in terms of flow um, for the audience to be aware is uh, JP and I will be going back and forth um, between um, sort of the different components of things. If um, we've tried to keep it straightforward in terms of a label at the top, if there's something that says MAP, it's referring to the MAP substudy. If it, there's something we're saying uh, O2, it's referring to the oxygenation component of things um, and um, slides that don't have either will represent kind of an overall general commentary about the study trial. So this uh, these two uh, studies were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in August of 2022. Uh, it was a factorial two by two uh, trial in which, as you can see, both the blood pressure targets and the oxygen targets were investigated uh, in the comatose survivors of cardiac arrest. Um, and kind of the overarching view of what we're going to be presenting for the next while is that uh, with the pre-specified targets that we'll get into, they found no significant difference uh, between uh, outcomes in the either restrictive or liberal oxygenation or uh, MAP targets here. So in terms of the um, MAP target uh, themselves, uh, just to provide a bit of background, certainly a central part of post-resuscitation care is maintaining adequate perfusion pressure, but evidence for a specific blood pressure target is quite limited. Blood pressure is actively managed as part of most ICU protocols to deliver sufficient uh, perfusion pressure to vital organs like the heart and brain and the kidneys. However, after a cardiac arrest, patients often have underlying or uh, concomitant heart disease and lowering afterload may actually facilitate cardiac recovery and possible, uh, possibly impact survival. And then in addition, um, vasoactive medications, uh, including catecholamines, are used to keep that uh, MAP generally above 65 in the majority of comatose survivors of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, although vasopressor therapy in and of themselves may actually have uh, some significant adverse effects. And there have been three small randomized trials prior to the uh, box trial being uh, published that uh, compared the efficacy of two different blood pressure targets with uh, the use of surrogate endpoints. Um, uh, sort of in general, the results of the three studies were actually neutral, but and um, important to note that none of them were powered to evaluate to evaluate clinical endpoints uh, and safety of different BP targets. Coma care was the first of this study of these three studies, which um, looked at three components of post arrest care, including carbon dioxide, oxygen and MAP targets. Um, here you can see the sort of screenshot of the uh, intensive care medicine publication back from 2018. Um, where they presented the data regarding the MAP target specifically. Um, they randomized 123 participants to low normal, uh, which they defined as 
uh, 65 to 75 millimeters of mercury versus high normal. And um, uh, they looked at uh, a primary outcome of a serum concentration of neuron specific enolase at 48 hours after cardiac arrest. Um, uh, high serum levels of uh, neuron specific enolase are associated with ischemic brain injury and poor outcomes after cardiac arrest. And ultimately, the study concluded that blood pressure, as you can see here in this figure, did not actually impact the levels of this enzyme uh, at 48 hours, uh, nor any um, sort of um, underpowered interpretation of uh, clinical outcomes. The second of these studies was a, was another small study called Neuroprotect, which was published in 2019 in the European Heart Journal. Um, the uh, investigators looked at whether an early goal-directed hemodynamic optimization strategy of a map of 85 to 100 is safe and it could improve uh, cerebral oxygenation. They targeted um, SVO2 of 65 to 75%. Um, they also want to look to see whether or not there was a reduction in anoxic brain injury um, or and uh, er, explore the relationship between these, this higher MAP target and clinical outcomes, again, although underpowered. In total, they included 112 participants um, that were randomized um, to this higher MAP target of 85 to 100 versus 65, and they looked at an MRI-based outcome uh, at day five post-arrest. They found no difference between um, both of these patient groups and um, the uh, number of patients, again, underpowered, um, but with favorable neurological outcome at 180 days was also similar. <clears throat> Ultimately, the study concluded that targeting a higher MAP in post um, cardiac arrest patients was safe uh, and did improve cerebral oxygenation uh, based on their measurements, but did not improve the extent of anoxic brain injury on MRI, nor uh, any differences in neurological outcome. The third small study was the endothelial dysfunction and resuscitated cardiac arrest, otherwise known as the ENDO-RCA study, which was published in EHJACC. These are actually the same authors as the BOX trial. They looked at, um, a pi they presented data from a pilot study uh, where a single center double blind trial of 50 consecutive um, comatose uh, survivors of out of hospital cardiac arrest were randomized to receive, excuse me, a MAP target of 65 or a MAP target of 72, and the primary endpoint was a <clears throat> plasma concentration of sol uh, soluble thrombomodulin at 48 hours. Um, this enzyme is a marker of endothelial injury and is also associated with poor outcomes following out of hospital cardiac arrest. And ultimately, they demonstrated that despite targeting a higher MAP, there was no differences in the soluble thrombomodulin um, over time. So now in terms of the uh, oxygen toxicity, I just want to briefly touch on some of the background physiology uh, of why this would be a problem. And this uh, here's a diagram from a uh, review in Crypt Care in 2021 uh, that I thought nicely displayed a lot of the components of uh, hyperoxia toxicity. And really fundamentally, this revolves around the formation of reactive uh, oxygen species. And you can see that there's a variety of adverse effects that they can have from vasoconstriction, uh, DNA damage, increasing uh, inflammation with subsequent end organ damage that can range from delayed vasospasm and CBI, coronary vasoconstriction, uh, the questionable incidence, uh, increase in incidence of cancers, um, and potentially actually causing mucosillary damage. And the concept of oxygen toxicity is certainly not new anymore, and it's kind of been uh, many years ago. It's been demonstrated first at uh, hyperbaric levels, and then subsequently even at uh, norovaric le levels. That even in healthy volunteers uh, who are breathing 98 to 100 percent oxygen, they actually did start developing chest pain and dyspnea somewhere between 30 and 74 hours uh, after that. Then the question further becomes in kind of a uh, Kind of a two hit scenario where there's already been an ischemic uh, reperfusion injury, could these dangers of the hyperoxia be worsened? So that's led to several trials, um, some of which are likely familiar to the audience at this point. And one of the landmark papers in this area was the Oxygen ICU trial, which was published in 2016. And this was investigated among critically ill patients with an ICU length of stay of 72 hours or longer. Was a conservative protocol for oxygen therapy uh, something that would result in lower mortality? Now, an important point around uh, this is that their uh, 
uh, restrictor group actually was allowed to have a PaO2 up to about 100 millimeters mercury, which, as we'll talk about in a while, was actually uh, pretty comparable to the uh, liberal group of the Vox trial. So as times go on, our kind of definition of liberal and conservative uh, has certainly uh, changed a bit. And here you can see a, uh, a pretty striking change in IC mortality uh, based on the conservative uh, oxygen uh, therapy. And while this was uh, a I randomized trial, there were a few uh, major uh, criticisms of this uh, trial, including that it was a single center, non-blinded, uh, and that there was an unplanned early termination of the study. And there were some baseline imbalances between the groups, which could have favored um, this increased mortality benefit in the conservative group. Um, and finally, that this study actually did have quite a low fragility index, so it wouldn't have taken much for these results to change. Uh, but fundamentally, still kind of one of the large RCTs, which did show that uh, perhaps the in the intensive care population, there would be good reason to consider a more conservative auction target. Um, another trial that's uh, we're discussing is the hot ICU trial, which is published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2021. Uh, this was an RCT investigating the lower higher oxygenation targets for patients with uh, acute hy uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure. And again, in here, you can see that they actually were unable to show a difference uh, between the uh, higher lower uh, targets at this point. Again, in this point, their uh, conservative and liberal targets were a bit closer um, to what will actually end up being the, uh, sorry, the the uh, their liberal targets were lower than in the auction issue trial. Um, so we're kind of, again, progressing into a more conservative era. And then the, really the study that's kind of generated the, the specific question for the Vox trial was the ICU ROX trial, which was published in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine in 2020. Uh, and this was a uh, RCT around conservative oxygen therapy during mechanical ventilation in the ICU. Uh, their primary outcome in this study was uh, the number of ventilator-free days at day uh, 28, so a different outcome than our previous studies have been looking at. And overall, they were unable uh, to show a difference in all comers. Uh, and you can see here the uh, Kappa-Meyer plot for probability survival along, along with their primary outcome of number of ventilator-free days. However, uh, they did have a very interesting subgroup analysis in which the uh, suspected hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy uh, had a rather significant, actually, difference with the use of a conservative oxygen target. And it was this uh, subgroup hypothesis that led to the specific question that's being asked in the Vox trial, that in patients, uh, of course, of comatose after a cardiac arrest in this patient group, would a conservative oxygen target have a mortality benefit? Uh, in terms of kind of some trial mechanics, it's worth noting that in the ICU rocks. Uh, trial. This was based on an SpO2, not a PaO2, so there were some fundamental differences in how uh, the trials were run, but the question was still generated uh, from this trial here. Um, so we'll go over some key features of the box trial uh, study design at this point. These are these are features that are consistent across both of the studies that were published in New England, uh, the MAP targets and the oxygen targets. Um, so as uh, JP briefly mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, the box trial was um, uh, two by two factorial design. Um, so patients were randomized to two different, um, uh, if you envision a two by two table, some people would be getting high oxygen, low MAP, high oxygen, high MAP, some people are getting low oxygen, high MAP, low oxygen, uh, low MAP. So um, they could be randomized to different components there, that way. It was performed, it was an investigator initiated uh, a study performed at two tertiary cardiac uh, centers in Denmark. Recruitment was from um, March 2017 to December 2021. And um, <clears throat> uh, the patients were uh, enrolled by investigators and then consent was obtained uh, later on. Um, the, this is as a result of the Danish legislation that permits immediate inclusion of patients who are unable to provide uh, consent in clinical trials um, uh, until a uh, obviously a proxy um, could be identified, uh, some sort of substitute decision maker 
Um, and then if the patient regained consciousness, um, they uh, reconsented the patient directly themselves. Um, ultimately, uh, this is similar to the way that we've also practiced and um, the way that we've done some of our, our studies here as well. Um, uh, so uh, sort of in keeping with things we're familiar with, there was an independent uh, DSMB that oversaw the trial. Um, there were two planned interim analyses um, at uh, 204 patient recruitments, and um, uh, ultimately um, the study did go on to, to, to completion. Um, In terms of who was included in the trial, um, their inclusion criteria were pretty simple. So they had to be adult patients um, and out of hospital arrest of presumed cardiac cause. And in terms of that being a presumed cardiac cause, we can go through the exclusion criteria. It'll basically go through excluding the non-cardiac causes. Um, they needed to have sustained ROS, which they defined as um, when chest compressions have not been required for 20 consecutive minutes and signs of per circulation persist, and uh, that they were unconscious with a GCS less than nine and not able to obey verbal commands uh, after they've achieved that sustained ROS. In terms of the patients that they uh, excluded, uh, the whole uh, list is here, uh, and mainly you can see that uh, they're trying to filter out basically anything that would likely have a non-cardiac cause uh, or that wouldn't have hypoxic ischemic injury. So uh, conscious patients, uh, we were not on anyone who could be pregnant in the trial. Uh, in hospital arrest was not considered during uh, this particular investigation. Uh, in particular, what's worth noting is that a bleeding diagnosis was not a, an exclusion criteria, uh, in particular, with given that many of our cardiac patients would be on uh, either anticoagulants or antiplatelets, it was important to uh, consider that point there. Uh, and then if they had a neurologic event, there were uh, a, a primary neurologic event, then again, they were excluded, uh, asystole given their poor uh, known outcomes. Known disease making 180 days survival unlikely, which admittedly it's a potentially a bit of a uh, vague exclusion, but when we go through the concert diagrams, you'll notice that how many people did get excluded on that grounds. Uh, if they had pre-existing neurologic deficits, uh, they had a four hour window to screen and enroll uh, patients during the trial, or if they were too hemodynamically unstable uh, to basically tolerate usual care uh, and actually achieve a higher MAP target, then they would not become eligible for the trial. And then if they uh, were hypothermic on admission, given that that would be a major confounder to neurologic outcomes. All the patients underwent temperature control at 36 degrees Celsius with sedation and mechanical ventilation for at least 24 hours. Um, the target for the core body temperature was actually achieved using either intravascular or surface cooling devices. Um, after the maintenance period of 36 degrees Celsius, the gradual temperature was rewarmed uh, to normal thermia and sedation was weaned. Um, patients were receiving mechanical ventilation and were sedated primarily with the use of propofol and fentanyl, and assessment of neurological outcomes was performed by the attending physician. And as mentioned, here is the uh, kind of consort diagram going through um, the patients that they assessed, and of the nearly 1,200 patients that um, or assess for eligibility, about 800 um, were uh, randomized to the trial, so they uh, didn't have to filter out uh, a, an excessive amount of uh, patients there. And as mentioned, the uh, survival at 180 days being unlikely only excluded 19 of their uh, 1,000 patients fulfilling the inclusion criteria. And then, uh, oh, don't control the slides. there we go. Uh, and then after they were randomized, uh, the uh, outcomes were relatively balanced, and there was only a few patients where no intervention was started or that they were uh, uh, unable uh, to randomize. Uh, of note, uh, at the bottom here, you'll notice that uh, dead before follow-up seems to come out before the bottom part of their slide, um, uh, but death was a part of their primary outcome. And uh, while well, this was actually taken from, this is figure S1 from the self variant appendix from the map arm, uh, the construction diagram for the oxygenation arm looks nearly identical. So um, for a sake of not uh, repeating ourselves, we'll not uh, be showing both. Uh, so in terms of the outcomes, as I kind of alluded to uh, a moment ago, the primary outcome was a composite of all-cause mortality and the CBC class uh, three or four, which represents severe disability or coma within 90 days of randomization. 
randomization, and this was the primary outcome for both of the arms of the trial. In terms of their secondary outcomes, all-cause mortality, uh, time to renal replacement therapy was considered a secondary outcome in the MAP arm, but was actually reported as an adverse event in the oxygenation arm. They also measured neuron-specific enolase levels at 48 hours. Again, as Pietro mentioned, a marker of poor neurologic outcome after cardiac arrest. Their MOCA score at three months, modified Riken score at three months, and just the CPC score alone at three months. Uh, note that due to this ending up during the COVID pandemic, some of the uh, assessments were performed through a tele-interview or through review of hospital charge for some patients, which actually precluded the use of uh, the MOCA in, in all cases here. And now in terms of the CPC uh, score, so the cerebral performance category, um, it's so CPC5 would be kind of brain death, so that would come into their alcoholic mortality. Uh, as you can hear, CPC3 and 4 represent uh, either severe disability dependent on others for daily living and what we would probably generally describe as uh, not, not a high quality of life when having discussions with patients' families. Uh, CPC4 being a coma of vegetative state, and then CPC1 or 2 being outcomes that would generally uh, be presented to patients as likely being uh, reasonable functional outcomes to be aiming for after a cardiac arrest. With respect to the uh, statistics, um, they analyze their primary and secondary outcomes using a proportional hazards model with event free survival and a Kaplan Meyer analysis. They did have pre-specified subgroup uh, analyses that they that they performed and will show you of their primary outcome in each of the, the two arms. Um, and they had no plan for any uh, multiplicity testing in terms of their secondary outcome. So um, the p-value is only presented for their primaries. In terms of MAP targets uh, specifically now, um, again, many of these things we've been talking about are related to the general uh, study conduct and um, now we'll get into the nitty gritty details of the results of the MAP targets. Um, so the trial intervention was actually very cleverly done. So they were able to um, blind clinical staff, investigators, patients, and outcome assessors um, with respect to their blood pressure targets. This isn't true of the O2 uh, targets, so as JP will talk about in a moment, but um, they were able to blind the MAP. Um, and the way they were able to do this was that they actually used um, they uh, used Philips monitors that had the ability to have uh, an alteration in their calibration. So whenever a clinician or the, the clinical team was looking after the patient, what they would see on the monitor would be a map of 70. And there was a 10% error in calibration, either up or down. And so the underlying true map that the patient had, for example, would be either 77 or 63. And that's how they got to those two um, uh, targets uh, in terms of their map as shown there on the screen. Um, so again, <laughs> excuse me, it actually um, what all the clinical teams were seeing um, was um, uh, the screen showing a map of 70, not knowing whether or not the map was truly 63 or 77. I thought that was a very clever way of them uh, to maintain the blind, which obviously is quite challenging as you're caring for these patients. Um, they had a three step approach that was recommended in their study protocol in terms of achieving the target map. So they asked them to uh, target a, a central venous pressure of around 10 millimeters of mercury um, and uh, norepinephrine infusion was considered to be kind of their first line pressure. And then they recommended uh, dopamine as a uh, second line pressure if needed. In terms of the patient characteristics, uh, rather than showing the table, I just figured I'd highlight a couple of the key things. So their mean age across both groups was around 62 years old. There was 80% males, 50% of the patients had hypertension, 25% of the patients had a previous MI, 85% of these patients had a shockable rhythm. As JP mentioned, asystole was considered a, uh, an exclusion criteria, but only if it was unwitnessed. Um, nearly 90% of uh, the patients had uh, bystander CPR performed. Uh, um, about 20 minutes until ROSC, 50% uh, uh, of patients actually had a STEMI on their post-ROSC CG. Their lactate was only about 5.5 to 6 on arrival, again indicating that these were fairly shorter uh, rests in terms of low flow and no flow times, and um, uh, fairly high uh, suspicion is that there's very high um, uh, bystander CPR efficacy. <clears throat> 
can see here that <clears throat> at uh, in terms of the baseline, um, so the BR there stands for before randomization. You can see the blood pressure targets in the low group, which is blue, and in the um, high group, which is red. They were fairly similar, um, and they did achieve that separation. Obviously, the concern would be that despite the 10% calibration error that was built into the monitor, is it actually possible that patients weren't actually um, divergent in terms of the MAP targets that they were seeing? And you can see here that based on their map over time at serial time points, that there is a clearly the red lines are much higher than the blue lines, and therefore there was um, fairly sufficient separation uh, in terms of their map targets themselves. Um, here's the Kaplan-Meier curves in terms of that low blood pressure and high blood pressure targets, and you can see here the, that uh, the lines are basically superimposed on one another, and there was no difference um, in uh, survival or uh, good neurological outcome at 90 days. In terms of the, um, the sort of tabular format, you can see here that again, the p-value in terms of the efficacy endpoints uh, was non-significant um, with respect to the primary outcome, and then none of the secondary outcomes um, seem to have any um, uh, difference between them either. Um, notably, there was not really any significant differences in uh, things like arrhythmia, um, uh, sort of uh, changes in the patient's metabolics, um, um, and they even included things like seizure. There was really no difference in any serious adverse events either, despite targeting a, a higher MAP. Um, notably, there was also no difference. Uh, sorry, I wanted to mention specifically for their secondary outcomes. The second point there is acute kidney injury with renal replacement therapy. There was no difference. Um, there was some thought that potentially increasing um, MAP targets would actually be uh, protective from a renal perspective, um, and that potentially there would be some reduction in acute kidney injury, but uh, that uh, there was no difference uh, in those rates. Um, the results appear to be consistent across most of the pre-specified subgroups. There is this interaction there that you guys can see uh, on the screen with respect to COPD. The authors specifically comment on this in their um, in their uh, discussion that they think it's a spurious association and the results of this should be interpreted with caution. Um, hard pressed to find a specific physiological reason for why somebody with COPD would necessarily benefit from a higher map. And so um, generally, there was a consistency and uh, there was no heterogeneity of treatment effect across these different subgroups. Um, and, um, uh, you know, certainly we, we want to um, be aware that the COPD group did potentially have um, uh, higher blood pressure uh, benefits, but uh, again, noting that there are very, very small numbers of patients with COPD. I think this trial has numerous strengths. It is the largest trial of post ROSC, uh, post -ROSC excuse me, MAP targets, and it is the first trial to actually be powered for clinical outcomes. Remember those three studies I presented at the beginning did not, uh, were not powered for um, clinical outcomes. They did comment on some explore, uh, sort of exploratory findings, but this was the first study to actually be powered. I think it was very ingenious the way that they were able to actually blind um, the, the, um, the everybody involved in the trial to um, what MAP target the patient was actually uh, at uh, with the calibration changes that they were able to do on the monitor. There are some limitations, uh, you know, COVID-19. <clears throat> I think this is a comment that we're going to be seeing more and more as these large randomized control trials are presented over time. Um, you know, that COVID-19 did um, uh, result in some uh, limited follow-up assessments. And um, certainly this was limited, the, uh, the study was limited to only two centers, and there was a fairly high prevalence of acute coronary syndrome mediated uh, cardiac arrest, as well as high rates of probably high fidelity bystander CPR. <clears throat> and then the only thing that I think would be a discussion point, and I'm curious at the end what other people think, but they selected uh, dopamine as a second presser uh, if needed to achieve that higher MAP target. And so you know, whether or not that's something that is reflective of our practice here in, in Ottawa or in, in, in North America, frankly, and um, something that I think should generate a bit of discussion. Uh, so now we'll uh, chat about the other arm of the trial, looking at the auction targets. Uh, so the patient characteristics here uh, are still in the table format, but essentially the spread is more or less uh, identical to that of the MAP arm, the mean age, uh, was about 
62, they were 85% uh, male. Comorbidities were well balanced between groups without any particularly striking uh, prevalences. And as Petra already commented on, the lactate uh, initially was, again, uh, 5.8 versus 5.9, which is, uh, again, not necessarily fully consistent with uh, what we're used to seeing uh, in Canada. Now, in terms of the trial interventions, uh, I've kind of made a couple comments before around restricted versus the liberal targets, and they define the restricted target as a PaO2 of 68 to 75 millimeters mercury, and a liberal target as being 98 to 105 millimeters mercury, and then they had uh, pre-specified initial FiO2s that they would uh, place the patients uh, on. Uh, the FiO2 was adjusted if uh, the peripheral arterial saturation fell below 93% on their uh, pulse oximetry, and then there was arterial blood gases that were done at pre-specified intervals uh, to aid in maintaining this uh, really actually what looks like quite a, a tight target to maintain. Uh, the FiO2 was the only thing that was adjusted in maintaining these targets. The vent settings were otherwise done at the discretion of the attending physicians. Um, so in terms of the effects of, as mentioned that uh, in one of the previous trials, investigating kind of the three parts of post-arrest care map, CO2, you know, oxygenation, the uh, CO2 wasn't controlled for. Uh, the clinicians were not blinded. In this case, as we're unable to find people to the FiO2 that's set in the ventilator. So that is a difference uh, from the map arm. And then, uh, as mentioned again, they were all um, had t temperature control for the first uh, 24 hours. Now, uh, in terms of kind of the comment that just made around the uh, the FiO2 being the main thing that is titrated, uh, the obviously leaves a big question of kind of how many patients are having their feet played with. This is also the main two numbers that we'll be uh, using to adjust our PaO2s. Uh, so here, and from their supplementary figures, uh, you can see this is the uh, proportion of patients that had um, a peak greater than uh, 10 centimeters uh, of water, and there's uh, a relative, a somewhat, or sorry, they're relatively similar at the start, and then they spread out with the liberal arm, ending up having more uh, of the elevated peak as time uh, goes on. Now, in terms of them achieving a difference between their PaO2 uh, here. Uh, you'll notice that at the time of winding, they're similar and they do achieve their uh, at separation at the two hour mark, and this kind of progresses throughout. However, unlike the map arm, and this is a point I'd kind of be interested in bringing up in discussion, to me, these differences seem rather small with uh, a rather significant amount of overlap, especially in the early period. Uh, and it's worth noting that uh, it took until at least two hours after randomization to. Uh, it, achieve this, which would have been up to four, at that point, up to six hours after their arrest. Uh, other things uh, to mention is that even in the liberal arm, some patients did actually end up on a FiO2 less than 0.3, uh, and the PF ratios that were seen in this trial were actually significantly higher than in previous trials, looking at conservative oxygen therapies in the ICU, suggesting that, again, some of these patients may have been potentially kind of almost too healthy to get a benefit from that. Uh, and here again, you can see that the FiO2 does uh, split as time goes on uh, more and more, but again with uh, a fair amount of overlap. And even in the liberal oxygen target arm, there were patients with an FiO2 of less than uh, 0.3 uh, all the way through the study. Actually, almost at time zero, 50% uh, of the patients in the liberal arm uh, were already at that target level. So, and then in terms of the uh, outcomes, this is going to be kind of, again, a rather similar uh, presentation from the map arm, but they were unable to find any difference in their primary outcome, which is death from any cause or a CPC of three or four at discharge. Um, you can see that there's 126 in the restrictive arm versus 134 events in the liberal arm. And then similarly, looking through all of their secondary outcomes, uh, they didn't manage to find uh, or demonstrate any difference in their uh, secondary comes recognizing that uh, none of this was adjusted for uh, multiplicity. And similarly, between their adverse events, there was no uh, difference noted, nor any uh, real signals in either direction for benefit or harm with conservative therapy. And then again, um, the Kaplan Meyer curve showing the probability uh, of survival since randomization. And this seems to actually be in kind of an even tighter fit than the restrictive and liberal map arms.
in terms of any relevant uh, subgroups uh, from this trial, uh, there's no uh, no subgroup that uh, achieved any significant benefit. Although if you do look at uh, non shockable rhythms, interestingly, uh, in this group, there is kind of wavering towards potentially some of that may be a benefit, but obviously at best that would be speculation and none of this was deemed significant uh, by the authors at this time. Uh, so the conclusion of the oxygenation trial is that in comatose patients who had been resuscitated after an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, there was no difference between restrictive and liberal oxygenation targets with respect to death or severe uh, disability at 90 days. So the main strengths of this trial include that it's a robust randomized trial that was analyzed with intention to treat analysis. Uh, there was similar characteristics that were uh, between the groups, and they did, technically speaking, achieve a difference between the oxygenation between the groups and the small asterisks there is, again, uh, just while well, that difference was there, it's not, not a large difference and it's a very narrow target for them. Uh, there are obviously some limitations to this trial as well, so it's non-blinded. Uh, however, given uh, it would be very difficult to blind investigators to this, we're likely not going to do better. Uh, at the time of randomization, the PAO2 was already very similar in both groups, and it was actually often already greater uh, than 113 millimeters of mercury. Uh, this is going to be significant for a couple of reasons. So first, if we consider that after the ischemic reperfusion injury is going to be likely the most vulnerable time, if there was a benefit to the restrictive oxygenation, uh, a, a large question could be asked that should that intervention have actually started sooner uh, and then given that essentially both patients or both groups of patients were often in the liberal arm for the first two hours, which also fits in thinking about clinical practice often, especially if they haven't been randomized yet. If you're transporting a patient, um, they've just been resuscitated often. Uh, there's somewhat liberal use of oxygenation immediately after airway procedures uh, uh, transport until uh, they get settled into the ICU. Uh, and they did actually, uh, in the terms of their power calculations, they were looking for a 10% absolute risk reduction uh, in their primary outcome, which given the uh, kind of, apart from the option ICU trial, given the rest of the literature not showing a significant uh, ben uh, benefit with restrictive oxygenation strategies may have been a big ask of the trial. However, given how similar the re results were between groups, uh, likely, that might not have actually affect, affected the results uh, or those conclusions, sorry. And then finally, as I already mentioned, there were pandemic restrictions effect and in in-person uh, cognitive testing, uh, but they did do a good job of trying to uh, compensate for that uh, as best that they could. And then again, in terms of the external validity, is this applicable to our population? Um, both myself and Petra have been alluding to these points here, but uh, there are some concerns that these trial participants did have factors associated with good outcomes. There was a lot of witness cardiac arrest, a higher rate of shockable rhythms. Uh, there seemed to be high quality bystander CPR and defibrillation, a somewhat younger age, and they had cardiac uh, cause of their arrest. And then again, this is a single country and tertiary care centers. Uh, and then their ethnicity uh, data wasn't reported, but based on kind of looking at the population uh, in Denmark, it likely uh, would primarily uh, be extrapolated to Caucasian populations. So what are our uh, take home points at this time? So in a perspective two by two randomized trial, neither a higher MAP target versus a lower MAP target, nor a stricter versus liberal oxygenation targets affected a composite outcome of death or severe disability at three months. The box trial has provided reassurance that we do not need to deviate from current practice uh, and would not likely change from the current targets uh, of a map grid in 65 or a PA02 target of 75 to 98, which would basically span both the restrictive and the liberal groups of this trial. Petra, you're muted. Sorry, I was still muted. Yeah, yeah, muted. Sorry, I was still muted there. Um, so the 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 question then becomes, well, what next? You know, certainly there's been a lot of talk about management of patients without a hospital cardiac arrest with the recent TTM2 trial, now with the box trial. Um, you know, we have some local interest certainly in in um, in, in this patient population as well. Dr. LeMay's presented, uh, published the data from Capital Chill. Um, uh, Dr. Russo is uh, is uh, working on you know, trial protocols for, for ongoing management of these patients as well. And um, I had the opportunity to briefly speak with Dr. Bernie regarding kind of what is next, you know, what, what, you know, what, 
possibilities are there for improvement and outcomes in these patients. And I just wanted to take a moment to highlight that this is obviously an, an active area of research. Um, you know, I've, I've gone through um, just by searching cardiac arrest on clinicaltrials.gov. You know, these are all these trials here are all looking at cerebral blood flow and oxygenation targets. Um, the, these, you know, there's a study being conducted <clears throat> um, um, uh, looking at the role of eCPR for patients with refractory at hospital cardiac arrest. There is descending aortic occlusion devices that are being investigated. You know, if we can include the descending aorta and improve perfusion to the brain, can we actually improve outcomes? There's, you know, differences in sort of uh, ventilatory uh, strategies uh, in cardiac arrest. People are looking at the role of prophylactic amiodarone for shockable cardiac arrest rhythms. People are looking at, you know, antimicrobials and and can we manage pneumonia a bit differently in these in this patient population? And so ultimately, I think you know the 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 landscape of the management of patients without a hospital cardiac arrest is going to be uh, it's going to be con continually informed moving forward. I think there is some good. Um, studies in the works to help us manage these very, you know, complicated patients with a very high morbidity and mortality uh, for us to try to improve their outcomes. Um, and certainly I look forward to our local endeavors in the future as well to try to see what we can do for these patients um, and uh, and contribute to their care. That's essentially all we had to say. We're happy to open up the floor for any questions or comments and um, uh, look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you, everyone. Thank you both. Uh, that was that was a great presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, some unique features. I really uh, like how they blinded the mean arterial pressure. That was very uh, innovative. Um, and something for consideration for the future, for sure. Um, uh, while folks uh, um, uh, gather their thoughts for for questions, I think they can put them in the chat or. Uh, we can unmute if they put their hand up. Um, and I don't know if uh, Sean wants to add any comments, if he's able. Uh, go ahead, Sean. Can uh, Sean be unmuted there, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, there we go. Is that, can you hear me? Yeah, OK, yeah, um, yeah. excellent presentation, JP and Pietro. Um, just to sort of comment on a few of the points that you mentioned, uh, uh, and they didn't really allude to it in the uh, the trial itself or in the script, uh, is that uh, that association with that group with the dopamine. I mean, I, I think that's an interesting choice. Uh, first and foremost, uh, if you look at the ACC guidelines, dopamine is certainly in there for the treatment of cardiogenic shock but it's not currently recommended by the critical care societies, nor is it recommended by the Emerge Medicine guidelines uh, because of some outcome uh, differences in cardiogenic shock and then certainly in, in sepsis. But with respect to neuroprotection, there's been some interest, uh, you know, in both in, uh, in brain injury and, and stroke patients on whether or not there's any neuroprotective benefit to dopamine and dopamine agonists. Uh, there's a large rehab trial Done on stroke patients on uh, L-DOPA and uh, Carbidopa, uh, which didn't seem to have a major effect, but it's just interesting that you know potentially that could have been a confounder. It would have been nice uh, rather than just getting a you know a vasopressor inotropic score, but to actually get the breakdown of what percentage of the uh, the higher target group ended up on uh, dopamine. I suspect it would have been higher, and as to whether or not that was a confounder. Uh, the other thing is, I mean, again, I was puzzled by that COPD notion. Uh, but certainly it, it sort of led me to look at some of the potential reasons why there may have been a, a benefit in that group. And interestingly, uh, I would assume that that group had a higher use of beta-2 agonists. Uh, and there's a lot of in vitro uh, evidence on traumatic brain injury and post-stroke injury in rat models of potential uh, you know, neuroprotection through astrocyte activation, uh, decreasing IL-6 production, decreased inflammatory response. So again, I mean, it's it, it's thought, you know, in in, in uh, hypothesis generating. It's certainly not uh, one of the things uh, that we can we can definitely say had an effect. But it's just interesting, seeing as they did see that trend. Uh, and one thing when I was looking at the forest plots um, that sort of struck me as odd is specifically as it came to the uh, the BP targets is uh, 
depending on the center, they seem to have diametrically opposed uh, outcomes. Um, and the one thing that really wasn't discussed much in detail was the subsequent third randomization that they gave very few details on, which was the randomization to a cooling device. Now, everyone had targeted temperature management to 36 degrees. And at some point, they were either uh, randomized to internal cooling devices or external cooling devices. And I wonder if maybe that randomization, they did describe how they did it. I wonder if one center used one device and the other centers used a different device. And maybe that accounted for some of the differences that we see, uh, you know, just between uh, at the bottom of those uh, those forest plots between the two centers. In the BP arm, it seemed to be greater. In the uh, in the O2 arm, it seemed to be neutral at one site, but preferentially uh, favorable towards. Again, not statistically significant, but interesting nonetheless. Uh, again, though, guys, wonderful presentation. I think yeah, those are definitely some interesting points, and uh, particularly yeah, the cooling piece is something I don't think we dived into, but certainly was something that uh, is very, very curious, especially um, kind of given. Uh, I, I haven't actually uh, practiced much in the IC here, but I know in uh, London, where I just finished training, there was kind of uh, no use of invasive cooling devices. So kind of, and they're certainly not without some complications. So it would be interesting to get a get a better idea if that did actually have an effect on those outcomes. Yeah, for sure. I also would just like to comment that um, I, I agree with you that the, there's just basically two lines on this like other feature of their trial that they say we did, but we're not going to talk about it. Right. So I thought that that was a little bit kind of interesting. I, I suspect that there will be some sub papers to follow, which are going to answer that uh, specific question regarding types of cooling and and uh, whether it was center specific or not. Um, you know, um, I, I agree that the use of dopamine as a second line presser um, could could have confounded that relationship, um, you know, with the higher map targets as well. So um, I agree with you. It would have been very, very nice to have that data presented in a little bit more of a granular fashion as to um, what uh, what pressers people were on. Um, and um, um, the one thing I would I would sort of uh, just comment on as well in terms of, you know, the fact that uh, this was a recommended protocol in terms of the uh, volume resuscitation, norepinephrine, dopamine uh, strategy. Uh, it wasn't enforced, and so uh, the clinician could have chosen to use a different uh, presser. Um, you know, I I think the uh, vasotropic, uh, I, the vasoactive inotropic score is uh, sort of a good global measure of the amount of support somebody needs. But I agree with you that there might be some nuance to the way that. Um, um, these pressers were used um, in terms of the, that, this relationship between map targets and, and outcomes. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, first, the, in the inclusion criteria, it was cardiac arrest. Did they take anybody where it was uncertain um, or were these patients not included? And it's just, it was almost exclusively cardiac. Uh, so they needed to suspect a cardiac cause and have gone through um, all those other exclusion criteria. So certainly kind of the witness asystole patients, um, there's the opens the door for that to have been uh, potentially something metabolic. Uh, I'm just going to pull the exclusion criteria up again here. Uh, uh, so it certainly did any patients of a non-cardiac cause squeak through, likely somewhere. Um, is, was that kind of your question there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, but the uh, if if you look kind of uh, looking at the breakdown of kind of where kind of they've excluded patients, um, it's, it's yeah certainly I think kind of the main place that you would expect it to be a non cardiac origin would be something metabolic that's presented with witness sure. systole or an arrhythmia. Uh, uh, but it would be it would be hard hard to prove prove that beyond these exclusion criteria. I expect. And um, did I understand correctly, um, Pietro, that that there was actually legislation um, that allowed them to randomize to, without um, patient or uh, um, uh, proxy consent, uh, like that the in yeah. investigator could randomize. So there was legislation the, to, from the there is Danish legislation government. that. That, uh, that there's Danish uh, legislation that allows them to randomize patients into critically ill, 
uh, critical care related uh, studies um, without consent. Um, while they are obviously making active efforts to try to get an SDM to consent. Um, sure. And if the and if the SDM did con did consent, great. And then um, ultimately, if the patient regained consciousness, they were able to also uh, reconsent. That's very similar to the way that um, and, and if Dr. LeMay's on the call, he could probably comment, but very similar to the way that we ran things with um, with Capital Chill, there was um, sort of emergency sure. uh, consent that was uh, sort of um, presumed, and then uh, we contacted SDMs as as quickly as we could to to continue that consent process. And it's worth um, noting that legislation is specifically for non pharmaceutical trials, so um, yeah, intervention. Okay, so oxygen is not considered uh, um, pharmacologic in that sense. No, no, yeah, yeah not not in yeah. that sense. Yeah. Um, and and um, uh, so, but but there's, do we have? There's no legislation like that in Canada, I don't think. I mean, we get REV approval to do it, but um, I agree. Yeah, it's a, this was an REV specific thing that uh, we we've done here in the past, but uh, uh, certainly um, the the authors were fairly yeah. clear that there is legislation by the Danish government. So, how did they consider? Um, uh, uh, patients, um, there are some other questions coming in here. So how, how did they um, consider patients who withdrew after or after they gained consciousness? Um, if JP I, goes forward one slide, yeah, exactly there. There, uh, there you go. So so um, they um, uh, nine patients in the high blood pressure arm here, for example, withdrew consent um, and three in the low target blood pressure withdrew consent um, after you know uh, despite having had emergency consent initially they did not consent to ongoing participation in the study right right um two more quick questions so did they look at the interaction between the two since they had a two by two design they did they report that there was no interaction uh, okay the <clears throat> between the map and o2 targets yeah and, and I see Sean has um, made a comment about the Mega Rocks trial, randomizing 40,000 patients, 6,900 post cardiac arrest to restrictive and liberal O2 targets. So perhaps we may detect less than 10% benefit when, um, when that is published if the trial goes ahead. Um, yeah, for sure. I think certainly Mega Rocks is going to be a, a, a huge study. Obviously, uh, Paul Young in Australia is leading that, and uh, it's uh, they're recruiting like crazy. Um, it's just like an exponential curve, and um, I think that will be informative in terms of giving us some data uh, uh, in the post cardiac arrest population as well. So let me ask you both: um, What are you going to do now um, for your post ROSC patients? based on this trial and other information that you have, what would you recommend to the to the audience um, and so on? Uh, so I, I think essentially uh, the adder can kind of basically continuing current current best practice. Um, so uh, in terms of whether you're uh, uh, personally, uh, my aims are generally to have an SPO2 of 92 to 96. Uh, and those patients when I was uh, previously in ICU and um, still admittedly this while there was no subgroups uh, that specifically uh, show, showed any benefits um, given other trials in particular around that look at cerebral auto regulation I may aim slightly at a higher mat target even at the 70 inch given that there's been no signal of harm to that um, the 70 to 75 and that's admittedly is a bit of an evidence uh, gray zone, but uh, I think with evolving literature on cerebral autoregulation uh, and the lack of harm demonstrated with a higher mapped uh, target here, that would be personally where my map targets would lean. Petro? Yeah, I mean, I must admit, I think overall, um, we've had a lot of sort of neutral trials now in, in uh, post cardiac arrest patients and, um, you know, with TTM2, uh, now the box trials, um, I think we continually, you know, my personal belief is that, um, again, very similar to to uh, JP, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, targeting kind of a normal oxygen saturation, 92, 95, something like that. And and I think as long as you're keeping your amp above 65, I think that would be reasonable. It is important to note that the um, box trial investigators are actually 
um, doing another study where they're um, looking at cerebral blood flow in patients. Again, a small pilot study, but they're actually going to be targeting a map of 95. So patients will be assigned either. Uh, so the same patient will be actually be assigned a map target of 60 for a few hours, then 85 for a few, 80 for a few hours, and then 95. And um, they're going to look at sort of differences in surrogate outcomes with that. And you know, I think that that's going to gear up um, you know a higher map target uh, trial, an even higher map target trial in in the future. But I think for the time being, um, I would not necessarily uh, target a map much more above 65. OK, great. Um, I'm going to try. I don't know if it'll work, but um, maybe if we can put Michelle LeMay on the spot, given his long term um, experience in this population, uh, if he wanted to add any further comments. Um, can we unmute Dr. LeMay? I believe that's Michelle Guest. Um, and see if he can. Michelle, are you there? OK, he's unmuted, but I don't know if he's able to comment. Um, if there are no other comments or um, or questions, I want to thank you guys for a great presentation. Um, very informative and um uh well well presented very very um excellent review of the literature and some interesting aspects of this trial um and look forward to to future work in this area um michelle says awesome talk my mic is not working so ready to go all right uh with that we'll we'll conclude and thank you again um and i wish everybody a great day thanks everyone thanks Thanks, guys.